Amen. Just completely turned around. Yes. I was going the wrong way once and God turned me around. He called me by my name. I'm not like the Apostle Paul exactly, but he didn't know my name. I thought I knew where I was going, but I found out that I don't know where I'm going. Didn't know. I do now, though. You know all the gospel songs you can sing at a time like this? I'm on the Lord's highway. Joe said, I hope you don't sing that one. I'm not even sure if that's one or not. I just, it just came to my mind. <laughs> but I'm on the Lord's highway anyway. Everybody, let's stand together like we're, like we're marching. Somebody told me this week, I don't know if they're right or not, they said that When you're walking, all you're doing is falling. But you put your foot out in time to catch yourself. And, and you learn to do that. Well, you know, that might be right. So anytime you feel like you're falling, just put your foot out in the power of God. Amen? And the strength of the Lord. Amen. And the power is beyond imagination. If you got a problem today, you got troubles today, got something wrong. I got some good advice for you. I know you know this, but maybe you didn't take time to do it. Let's do it this week. When you got a problem, let us have a little talk with Jesus. Let's tell him all about our troubles. He will hear our famous cries. And he will answer by and by.
losing Jesus. They were all worried about it. Jesus got them together that night when they had the Last Supper. And he said, I want to tell you something. You need to remember, in my Father's house, there's many dwelling places, many mansions, many houses. And you think I'm just going to leave you? He said, no, I'm going to prepare a place for you. That would be good, but he specifically said that if I go and do that, I'm going to come back again and receive you unto myself. There's a Baptist preacher from Milton, Florida, I heard this week, and he said he thinks he's getting close. Well, he could be very close. We don't know, but he could be very close. we got to be prepared, don't we? How much time do you have left? We don't know. A lot of people that I used to know don't have any time left. The Lord's called them home. And every time you marry, every time you say goodbye to a Christian lover, you mean you got to work harder. Somebody's got to get mad and stand in the gap and make up the difference. Somebody asked me just recently when I was going to retire. I said, you don't retire from this business. You know, you know what I'm saying. I might change my motives and have my mind die or something, but you don't retire. And you don't get to retire either in the Lord's work. You can retire to get your 30, 40, 50 cents. Some of you folks that should keep working, I'm telling you, I checked the tithes last week. Keep on working. <laughs> but you can retire, right? But not from Jesus. we got to work more than ever before. Oh, Jesus has called us. Lord, I want to, I want to reach out. Pray, pray for one another right now. Bind your hearts together. Cast your cares on Jesus. If you think of somebody that's in this congregation or maybe someone who's someplace else today, I want you to call out their name before the Lord. somebody in my church had to say goodbye. The Lord took them home. And not one of them said, so I'm just going to go and serve Jesus because I'm mad. They're broken hearted. They feel bad because they're losing the love of but, but they're not they're not down on God. They know the Lord's in control. If you think of somebody, the slightest thought comes into your mind of somebody with a need. I had a, I had a weird experience this week. God said to me, but I want you to think of somebody that, that you don't like. And I said, Lord, I can't do that. I'm, you know me, I love everybody. He said, well, somebody that bothers you. I said, well, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be anybody. He said, well, just think of somebody that, that you'd rather not think about. You know, this is between me and God. You know? I didn't know where this was going. I really felt the Lord just touched on my heart. And, and I knew what he was going to do to me. He likes to give me like this. He said, I want you the next time you pray, I want you to make them the main part of your prayer. I want you to pray for them. Oh, Lord, I got to pray for Of course you do. Who's going to pray for people that nobody else will pray for if the saints don't? Who's going to pray for the troubles and trials? Do you know when you have a victory or a breakthrough, the whole crowd shows up. But when you've got a problem and a burden and you got people that are being nasty and there's trouble, nobody wants to be part of that. You go talk to them about Jesus and I'll pray for you. Oh, no, God says you go talk to them. You love them. And then God told me after you get through praying for him, get in touch with him as soon as you can. I said, oh, well, you're already trying to rule my week, right? Love the saints of God. Is that what it says? Yeah. Oh, yeah, God. Love your mom and your dad. Yeah, it does. It says, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them. 
That's why the church is going to have power. Because we rise above this world, see. I want to, I want to get on top of things today, Lord. Folks, you're going to have to break it loose in your heart. You're going to have to make a commitment to the Lord. We can't do it in a congregational sense, in a corporate sense. You have to say, Lord, you've got my heart, you've got my soul, you've got my mind, and I'm going to pray, and I'm going to intercede for people. I'm going to go out to the trouble spots of life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Are you, are you prepared to serve this week? How many would, would say, Pastor, you, I'm going to raise up my hand just a moment when you ask me to. And I'm going to say that by doing that, I will reach out to an uncomfortable thing if it, if it needs me to a situation that I'd rather not be part of, but I'll do my, I'll do what I can. And I won't do it with a phony attitude. I'll do it with real love. You know, people can tell that you don't care. If you're putting on, they can tell. Am I right? Reach out to the Lord. You're going to need His help this week. That last part again. I want to stay on the utmost high and catch the gleam of glory bright. But still I'll pray till heaven I found. Yes, I have. I will. I pray. saw this, or you saw a replay of it. I, did, I didn't see it when it actually happened, but I saw a replay. The President of the United States was on a late night talk show just recently, and they had asked him if he would be willing to do a skit with the host. What they would do is he would play the part of somebody who would soon be out of a job. <laughs> he said, I can do that. And uh, looking for a job. And uh, the host was going to be the uh, guy from the corporation was thinking about hiring him. And uh, he was dealing with the dilemma that this person had been in the same job uh, for eight years. And with all of a sudden now having to make a change. So they come in there, and you, and you, and you got to love it regardless of what, what part of town you're coming from. And so just to take up, there's this one line that I thought about as I was talking about fighting our battles. <laughs> the president was sitting there, and so the, the, the person from the company said, uh, I see here you've been in the same job for eight years, and uh, you haven't had any kind of advancement. I said, well, there really wasn't any place to go. He said, I pretty well topped it out, you know. And, you know, they, 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 they preach at you about that in business. You know, always, you know, make, make a place for yourself. And then the, then the guy who was playing the part of the interview uh, gentleman said, uh, well, you, you did send in all the paperwork. He said, there, there is, though. He said, one document that seems to be missing. We don't seem to have your birth certificate. <laughs> And the president went, why, why is that important? He said, that's ah, okay, you don't have to have it. And then he said, there's another thing, sir. He said, on the paperwork, you know, we asked you to fill out how you would handle problems and how you would deal with conflict. And you just left that all blank. He said, have you never had any experience with that? He said, no. He said, generally when I have a conflict, I call in SEAL Team 6. <laughs> Come on. I, I called in SEAL, that's the Navy SEAL Team, you know, the president. Yeah. 
And it went on, and it was pretty good. Hey, they loosened up, folks. You're not know, going to make it the next two weeks. You're going to get a little loose. Everybody get a shake and say, I'm okay. <laughs> I feel better. So much better. God is God. Heaven is heaven. I'm so glad to know. And this world has, has never been a, a, a mystery. Now, listen, I'm not answering all the questions today, but the world's never been a mystery to the Lord. He knows what's going on. He might be the only one that knows sometimes, right? But the Lord knows. And I'm glad that we can be together. This is a wonderful opportunity. We're glad you're here. Uh, and we'll, we won't say it all the time, but we will mention that we have folks who join us uh, on a live feed of this service, and we're glad they can do that. And we would take a moment to ask anybody who might be doing that, if they would, on, on the, whatever means they're watching on Facebook, that they would share this. You see, when somebody shares something, then it automatically goes to all their friends. And uh, that just gets more people. I, I, I don't want a lot of pastors getting mad at me. I, I had a guy from my son's church. He said, I'd love to watch it Sunday, but I don't think your son would like it. <laughs> but uh, it can be viewed again. We put everything on YouTube um, under my name, the category of my name, uh, James Couts. My mother wanted to tell somebody. She called me up and asked me how to spell that. <laughs> well, she didn't really know that. She didn't do that. <laughs> I told her there's one more on there by that name, but he's from Canada, you know. He left the country. Well, I'm still here, but we're glad that we can be together and that we can keep on enjoying the things of God. God has given us so many opportunities to manifest His Word. Aren't you glad? And what about that? What about that Sunday school class? You know, what about that? Those that were there was that great? You know, I'm, I'm going to, speaking about that. Is I, I want all the Right now, all the kids that are going to be in children's church, I want them to leave right now, okay? It, because they got, I'll tell you why, you can't go back there if you're not in part of the children's church. But man, that, my wife has got all activities and festivals and food and Bible things. And she's got all kinds of stuff back there and uh, that, for them. And so I just want them to have plenty of time. We have the announcement here, you know, the children's church fall harvest festivals each Sunday. Kids, be sure to be here. She was cooking up some stuff for them to eat last night. I had to smell it. And, and, and it wasn't chicken soup either, let me tell you. Not that there's anything wrong with that. But, but anyway, but, but a wonderful Sunday school class. I know my wife and appreciates your participation and the wonderful comments that you made. If you can be with us, we have another opportunity to study God's Word, as you know, on uh, Wednesday nights at 7.30. Um, we've got that right here. Taking Captivity Captive, a Bible study based on the book of Jeremiah. Especially the part where Jeremiah is preparing God's people for the Babylonian captivity. Just about the time you think that there's no hope, Jeremiah steps up and give, gives people a message of hope. No matter what happens, God is around. God is faithful. God is true to take care of his people. We're looking at that in the book of Romans. Has God cast off his people? Paul said, God forbid. If you feel that God has forgotten you, Today we're going to show you again from the book of Romans how that God has not only not forgotten you, but he has made a specific place for you in his heart and life that no one else can fill. There'll be a void in God if you don't step into that place. Amen? God, God cares about you. So let's, let's have our ushers come and uh, receive the uh, offering this morning. Uh, I mentioned last week that something new. I've already done it. If you've got an offering either for the $1,000 BGMC pledge, uh, or anything else, missions, you can just mark it that way and it'll go to the right place. Otherwise, if you don't put anything there, it'll just be into the general fund. Which certainly we'll be glad to see anything that comes in. We're going to need to, as we of course ask, we have. Custom, it's certainly not our custom, but it's something that's been done for a long time, asking God to bless the offering. But in the greater sense, we're asking God to bless the people who are giving, right? The givers. Amen. In fact, if you get the givers blessed, the offering will be blessed. Amen. Amen. So tell you, don't pray today, not only for the offering, but for you as you give. And I, I want to pause. If this sounds so routine, but believe me, it is not routine. It's not rhetoric. And say thank you. Because I know that you've not only been faithful, but sometimes you've had to sacrifice. 
to meet the needs through the years. And it's not taken by me. I know that God knows about it, but so do many of God's people. And I speak on their behalf and, and say, God bless you this morning. Terry? Dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this time we can spend in your house today, Lord. And Lord, all the needs that are spoken or unspoken, Lord, we just lift them up and put them in your hands. And Lord, we just ask you to keep each person here in your care. And those people that can't be here, Lord, just put a blessing so they can come and be part of your church and your work, Lord. And Lord, as we go through this week, may we just be good stewards and to follow your word and to do your will, Lord. And again, Lord, we just ask you to bless this offering and those that give it, that they may just have their cups overfilled so we can continue doing your work. Lord, we just ask you to bless everybody here today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
happy day. It's a happy day. Talking about live feeds, I came across a live feed this week on Facebook, and in five minutes they had 30,000 people watching it. It wasn't ours. It wasn't, it wasn't ours. It was somebody else. I won't mention who it was, but you can probably guess. This is tremendous. But I want to tell you something that's very important in this age of great technology. And I'm all for it. Reach as many people any way you can that's legitimate. And there's nothing that you can say that's bad about that. But don't outsmart yourself. Sometimes it might not seem to be so new or so sophisticated. But if it's a means to touch another human being, don't just think of the 10,000 or the 30,000 or the 300. Think of the one. Paul was a great communicator, amen? amen? When I first went to Springfield, I went into our school out there in the middle of, of winter. And uh, I wasn't there two weeks, and we had a tremendous revival take place, starting in the chapel service. It was real. Take my word for it, folks. I know real revival. It was real. It just changed lives. And after a couple of days, I went back to the room and I, I got the old typewriter out, not the computer, or the keyboard, or the, no, not that. This was 1964, people, 65. Got the, got the old typewriter, the old Adler typewriter out. And I typed a letter to my mother trying to describe that revival. And I felt like I was anointed and preaching while I typed it. She made a copy of it and sent it to some friends of hers somewhere in a church. And, they read it in some service, and the Lord began to move, and she, she told me from her friend's report that people were being blessed and touched. Listen, get it out there. Cast your bread on the water. Say one word, ten words, to one person, to two people. You do not know what those people will do. I told the story to somebody this morning, early this morning, that didn't know. And I, and I give God the ultimate glory for making anybody's ministry larger, if that happens, but effective is the key word. But you, you've probably heard the story how when Billy Graham was an unknown traveling around with a few friends and a canvas tent, a small tent, going from city to city, he went to Hollywood in, in California, and uh, they would have 300 people in a service. That's not bad, but it's not what you would think about Billy Graham. Somebody went and took some pictures and wrote a little story about it and threw it on the desk of a newspaper man in Los Angeles named William Randolph Hearst. Ever heard of him? If you didn't, if you don't, ask somebody after the service. <clears throat> he, uh, he just looked it over. I don't really don't know what went through his mind, but he took the information, the, the report and the pictures, and he wrote a little note sent it to one of his editor, editors and said, Puff Graham, P-U-F-F. -F. Make this, make it up, talk about it. Let people know. And the rest is history. People started coming to those meetings. Well-known people got saved. That's the great revival with Stuart Hamlin. I often tell that story, the great songwriter. So many things. It is no secret what God can do until then. That's when he got saved. Well, Billy Graham would have gone on doing whatever the Lord wanted him to do, I'm sure, whether William Randolph Hearst had gotten involved or not. But you see, God is in control, and God can use this. You don't know what person you touch. Write it. Lay it on somebody's desk. Talk about it. Whisper in their ear. Climb up on the roof and shout it from the rooftops. See, Paul was a communicator. He followed the footsteps of the one who stopped him on the road to Damascus. And said, Saul, Saul, why are you troubling me? You need to be working for me. You're the kind of man I want on my team. God doesn't forget his people. See, Paul would say, as we said last week, has God cast away his people? God forbid. He said, I'm an Israelite. Paul knew that he was not cast off by God. God stopped him. You might give up, but God doesn't give up. He said, I'm praying for all the people like me. The reason why Paul emphasizes Israel so much here is, of course, he wants us to know through the Holy Spirit what God is doing. But he's talking about his own personal experience. We might discover, if we study the book of Romans to the right extent, how to be evangelists. One of the things we find here is you talk and deal with your situation. Paul said, I'm, I'm a Hebrew. I'm an Israelite. Let me tell you what God did for me. Because a lot of people would not listen about Jesus. He said they have a problem. 
They can be saved. First of all, you've got to say that about everybody. Remember I said, God, God said, think of somebody you might not especially enjoy being around. They can be saved. Jack the Ripper can be saved. <laughs> Jesse James can be saved. Captain Hook can be saved. Come on, folks. You know what I'm talking about? Don't you don't don't go after the saints. He looks like a likely candidate for salvation. He's almost there already. We want to find people that are just a couple of footsteps from heaven and push them in and say, well, that was easy. But that's not what God wants. He wants us to go into the dark places, into the difficult places. That guy on the food channel eats all the weird food, which could be several people, I know. <laughs> he was somewhere where they would get these fish by hand and live deep in the mud. And they were out there in the rice paddies and they were digging their arms down there. And he said to the guys, he said, is there, is there anything in here that's bad? And they said, yeah, cobras and things like that. He said, cobras? And they're sticking their hand all down there. He said, now, even the fish were trying to catch can take off your fingers. He pulls his hand out. And so anyway, you know, to make a long story short, he got a fish and they went and fixed it. You know how he does. He said it's the best tasting fish he ever had. I don't know if that's true or not, but he said, never did I get so funny for one meal. Never did I get so dirty for one meal. A lot of people have lived their Christian lives coming to the table and eating the meal that's been prepared, and then they leave the table, and they never know what it takes to provide, to serve, to clean up. They don't see the job. And so unless the job appears like that little image that they have, they don't do it. But God needs people. That we look at them and they look like they can't be saved, that they're lost for eternity, that they are beyond all hope and past prayer and say as Paul did, they might be saved. They can be saved. They, they even know about God, but they don't have it according to knowledge. And I want to go and help bring them to the one who will change God's righteousness, which they don't know anything about, to something they know through Jesus Christ, regardless of their situation. Paul said, people haven't all obeyed the gospel. Isaiah prophesied. He said, Lord, I preach, but who believed our report? Who listened to Isaiah many times? Who listened to Jeremiah? Who listened to Ezekiel? He said, the sound went all around the world. Didn't Israel know, Paul said? Moses said, speaking for God, I will provoke you to jealousy. I will cause you to desire me, but it's going to be, Paul always goes back to the Gentiles. He said, it's going to be by a people and a foolish nation that's going to come from the outside. The reason why he emphasizes that is because God makes it clear that he is the God of all men. And he has particularly used these ones that have rejected him for the most part. Not everyone, Paul said. Not everybody has said no. Some did follow the choice of Abraham. But he wants people to know that God brings them in and they become part of that great tradition. They enter into the family of God. See, Paul said, I'm an Israelite. I'm of the seed of Abraham. I'm, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. God hasn't cast away his people which he knew would serve him. There were ones that would serve him. He hasn't cast them away. But I want you to know that I believe Paul is also saying that God hasn't cast any of them away. People say, how can that be true? Because they cast God away. They cast him away. You understand the difference? He didn't cast them away. They cast him away. Saul of Tarsus was writing with papers to arrest Christians. On the way to Damascus, as we have mentioned, having cast God away but not knowing it, because when you reject his only son, you reject him, but God stopped him. Jesus was there to speak to him. So who, who was casting who away? Had God cut off the apostle Paul to be? No. He knew the possibility. When Jesus looked at Saul, he, he could see that he could be Paul. When, when Jesus looked at a man that would kill him if he had the chance and thought that killing Stephen was a good idea and went along with it, remember that? 
It doesn't mean much when you say it in the King James consenting to his death. That means, hey, kill him again. Hit him again. Jesus looked at him when he saw the man that wrote the book of Romans said, the inspiration of the power of the Holy Spirit. The man who went and preached in Greece, Macedonia, all around. See, that's what he saw. Somebody who had possibilities. You can practice liking people you don't like by watching some of the election information on the news. Come on. Don't be afraid. <laughs> Doesn't mean you have to vote for them. You just look and say, is there something about them I like? I have reserved to myself. I've saved for myself. I've got grace. There is a remnant right now according to the, there's an election, folks. It's called the election of grace. It's chosen by grace. I, this is a great gospel song out. I, I can't even think of who does it, but I hear it a lot on, on the gospel stations. Uh, the, 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 uh, the, the chosen by grace. Chosen by grace. It's, and we know we're saved by grace, but God has selected us. What he wants us to do is when we get into the salvation of the Lord, we want to look upon it as if it had been planned from eternity because it has. We're part of something big. He said if it's by grace, it's not of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. If it's a work, it's not grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. He said a lot of people did not obtain what they were looking for, but the elect have obtained it because the others were looking for the wrong thing. You're looking for something that doesn't exist. Finding God on your own. Isn't that what sin is trying to substitute for God? Finding God on your own? Some people that think they're alive and they're finding the truth, Paul said they've got the spirit of slumber. They're, they're falling asleep. He said they can't see and they can't hear. It's not going to work. Their eyes are dark. Now Paul said, have, have they stumbled? When we look at the world and all of the troubles and all of the people that are being lost, are they stumbling that they should fall? Does God want them to fall? Are people failing so that God can say, I'm glad to let you go. I want to see you lost. He said, no. See, that's not why. They're not falling to lose out. God wants to save them as they fall. He reaches out to them. And so Paul says in Romans 11, 13, I am the apostle of the Gentiles. I'm reaching out to those people. If by any means I might stir up my own people, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get Roman Satan, Corinthian Satan, Thessalonian people Satan. I'm going to get Ephesian Satan and Colossian Satan so that I can cause some of these Jewish brethren of mine to desire what they've got and come in and be part of it because I want to see them saved. He talks about reconciling. Christians better learn that word. We need to be all about healing. He talks about magnifying. He talks about receiving. He talks about first fruits. That's, that's new works. Things that are happening. Here's, wait a minute. Hold, hold on a second, preacher. Here's water. You were talking about being baptized. Why, why can't I be baptized? Remember, remember what he said? Remember what Philip said? You can be baptized. Do, do, you, do you believe? Did you get saved while I was talking to you? I didn't even give an altar call. Philip was with the Ethiopian and he didn't get a chance to sing just as I am or not one plea. A lot of preachers said, hold on a minute, we're not done with the altar call service yet. I'll call you a little later. Hey folks, I know about a man, I know about a Gentile that got saved while the really good preacher was preaching. He didn't want to go there. I'm, if, you don't, if you don't, I'm not going to play a guess again. It's Simon Peter at Cornelius' house. Remember the Roman soldier? He had become real interested in Judaism and being, being in Abraham's family. He, he, he thought that was good. Peter said to, to, to God, I don't care what he thinks about Moses. I'm not going to see him. In fact, Moses told me not to go in that guy's house. Like, I don't know. You're telling God what Moses thinks. Who told who gave him? Are you with me? You're looking at me like you never heard the story. Peter said, I'm not going to Cornelius' house. He's, he's unclean. Did you know that? But he's there preaching because God told him, you better go. You better listen. He's there preaching. And, and he's just preaching away. And did, I, I imagine he had a plan. 
He probably figured it wouldn't do any good. He was preaching. Did you know the mom he was preaching, that Roman soldier, not only got saved, before Peter gave an altar call, and before Peter ever got into Theology 101, he got baptized with the Holy Spirit. And he probably didn't even know there was such a thing. And Peter said, whoa, can you believe it? Listen to those guys. They're, they're doing just like we did on the day of Pentecost. Can you imagine this Roman soldier is, is speaking in other tongues. He must have been baptized with the Holy Spirit. What's happened to Jesus? And they're going, you don't even listen to me, Peter. I, I'll tell you what, I can change the world. See, that's what Paul's talking about. Reach out to people. Reach out to people. Don't be afraid of people. He said there's going to be some restorations. He says and, and we've all been crafted into the tree of, of God's choosing. And, and don't get arrogant just because you're saved that other people aren't. He says you've got to be humble about it. He said we want the branches that have been broken off to be grafted back in. We want people that aren't saved to be saved. We want people who don't believe today to believe. We don't, we don't want to be arrogant. We, we don't want to go around saying, well, I'm saved and you're not. In fact, he said, we better be careful because if God didn't spare the natural branches, take heed that he doesn't spare you. We're saved by grace. Totally. Whether you've got Abraham's blood in you or not. He said, if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and you were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more these which are natural branches of the original olive tree, when they get grafted into their own olive tree, shine for God. Paul said, I want to see God's people that were chosen, descendants of Abraham, followers of Moses. I want them back into this tree. Because folks, there's one tree, and it's a good tree. It's called all kinds of things. The tree of life. It's called the, the good olive tree. The olive tree is productive. Well, you read that, you read that business in Zechariah about that vision of that oil from the olive tree and, and, and those ladders that were burning. You read about Zerubbabel and Joshua the high priest at the time of the restoration and how God wants his people to be flammable for the things of God to bring a light into this world. He said, if you continue in his goodness, everything's going to be fine. Otherwise, you'll be cut off. But he said, if people are abiding in unbelief, and you look at them, you've got to say, as Paul said in Romans 11, 23, God is able to bring them in again. I, I know how you feel. You feel sometimes like there's no hope for some people. You really do, don't you? In my imagination, am I, am I depressing you or... So, I mean, it, it, you look so serious. I mean, it, this is serious business, but I, I thought maybe a groan once in a while would be a good sign. Do you ever give up on people? It's, I don't think it's possible for them to get saved. I told my wife last night, we were talking about how God works. You know, Art and Janet, we, we went by Shorty's house last night. And from then on, for the next hour, you can just imagine the thoughts of the members. That was a woman from our church here. If you know her, you know what I'm talking about. I'm not, don't worry about it. She just brings back a lot of memories. She goes way, way back. She's gone to be with the Lord. And we, we were all together tonight when we found that she had gone to be with Jesus. But we talked about so many people through the years. We got to thinking about people. And eventually, the conversation came to a person I don't think I ever said it out loud or didn't think it much, but in my mind, I pretty much figured they were gone for good from, from the kingdom of God. There just wasn't any hope for them. They'd been through everything. They'd been exposed to all kinds of people. They'd been exposed to my ministry and other people's ministries and on and on, but it just didn't seem like it was, it was ever going to happen. One afternoon, I got a telephone call from that man. I didn't know where he was. I wasn't even sure who he was. At first, he told me who he was. And I said, well, I know, I know who you are now that you told me. He said, I'm in the hospital, and the doctor tells me I'm going to die, and you need to get down here as fast as you can. And we, man, we had a prayer meeting. We had a revival in that room. The glory of the Lord came down. I didn't say, brother, why did you waste so much time? I just said, thank God that you called I would have never believed you would have called. 
If you had asked me, and don't try to figure out who it is because you, you, you don't know, that's another person. I wouldn't tell you about your friends. <laughs> but I, I, I would have never believed this person if I'd have picked the person that was most likely to call. But you don't know. I wouldn't even have been surprised if there was enough of the Word of God in this heart that if I hadn't made it for some reason, that he would have still been able to reach out to the Lord. The very fact that he made that call, he was already changing. It was like he was looking at Jesus, not that I, I was Jesus, but like the man looking at Jesus saying, remember me. How much do I know? Not much, but you remember me when you come into your kingdom. Folks, this is the way Paul lived. He has called upon the men and women of the church to reach out to people. He said, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are the judgments of God. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been God's counselor? Who's given to God first and then God gives it to you? Of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. Why did Paul break into a praise like that after talking about all of this promise of, of, of God's people being restored if they would return and the Gentiles coming to God? Why did he break into that praise? Because he wanted the Gentiles and the Jews both to know that it's all about the glory and the power of God. It's, a, it's about who God is and not who we are. The riches and the wisdom and the knowledge didn't come from us. It came from God. And, and, and it's of him. These are great. You talk about some glorious prepositions. These are sanctified prepositions. 1136. Of him, through him, and to him. All the good things, it's of him. And it comes to him. And it's back to him. To God be the glory. Great things he has done. Have you ever seen that just on your own? Just break out of the red light to God and be the glory? And let, me, and let me get you started now. Paul's going to move to a whole new area. To the church's responsibility on how to conduct their lives so they'll be most effective in being evangelists and missionaries. And he starts with one particular aspect that I want to use to close out today and to get us started the Lord willing for the next time we come together. You've heard it before, but now we've got it in context. He says, I'm begging you. I'm asking you. He's laid down a great picture of the world scenario, and it's exactly the same today. People that did know God, but live as though they never knew him. People that know him, but act as if they don't know him and don't care about people who don't know him. They won't reach out. People that have made their own way, all kinds, this is still the same. But the church is going to be the factor, the true church. You and me, the real saints of God. He said, you've got to present, by the mercy of God, your bodies, your lives, your beings. Everything about you. You can't do it by yourself, it's by the mercy of God. You've got to present it as a living sacrifice on behalf of these people. You're not a sacrifice for God. He doesn't need to be saved. He was your sacrifice. You need to be saved. But even though God died for them, you have to be a living sacrifice to present that message to them. And you've got to be, and listen folks, people say, well, I believe, I believe and I'm working. No, that's not enough. You've got to be holy. When you're not holy, you're ineffective. <laughs> How many remember a guy in the church that used to take care of some of our cars named Jerry? You ever had Jerry get mad at you? He, he said to his pastor one day, if you ever come in here with fuel injectors, this dirty, he said, I'm not going to be your friend anymore. He said, that's no excuse for this. I said, well, I didn't know they were like that. And you couldn't tell by the way the car was running? Well, that's why I'm here. <laughs> Folks, there's, there's, there's rules. You've got to get things cleaned up. You're not going to be effective. You're not going to get so many miles to the gallery. You're not going to ride smooth along the highway of life. You've got dirt and fuel injectors. You don't change the oil. Holy, except the Lord of God. And what did Paul do to really make us feel strange? He said... This says in the King James, this is a reasonable service. It means rational. It's the only thing that makes sense. In the Greek, he said, it's the only thing that's logical. It's for Christians 
to be holy and acceptable to God. And don't copy the world. Be transformed and have your mind made brand new by the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Now, I'm telling you, there's a lot of words. You need to go back to good Lord giving you strength before the next couple of days is over. And if you could do it today, it would be great. You need to go back in these chapters. This is, this is 9, 10, 11, and 12. We've gone to different sections there. Read those over and look at these magnificent words. And chew on them a little bit and digest them into your spiritual system. Wisdom and knowledge and judgment, sacrifice, holy, reasonable service, transformation. Read that. There's so many words. Write down all these glory words and think about them. And say, God, am I in there? Is that me? Am I part of this? Where do I stand? Get down before the Lord. Agonize before the Lord. Confess before the Lord. Ask Him for strength and help and restoration. Because there's somebody that's going to need you. There's a message that's going to have to be delivered by you. All of the television, radio, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter broadcasts in the world, telephone conversations. It's not going to reach everybody. There's people that only you can reach. There's somebody that doesn't know, but they're just waiting for you to come and reach out to them. And you'll make a difference in their life. And you might not get to see it. We don't, we don't work for the reward. We work because it's what we're supposed to do. It's what we want to do. It's what God has called us to do. It's a pleasure and a joy. Let me tell you, just as we're closing a little quick story, I've often mentioned, and I, and I apologize sometimes for being so nostalgic about things, but I've often mentioned that I had a wonderful teacher in the fifth grade, and he's still alive and I talk to him. And he's cleaning things out, and he sends me everything that has to do with this experience. He went, later on went to be with the State Board of Education. But he says things to me, he says, I'm the keeper of the flame. And I, and I tried to get, I, I've probably been in contact with 75% of the people that were in that fifth grade class. We did so many things together. He just recently sent me a card that we put together for him on his birthday. And I got the actual card. It's all brown color. And all of us in the class signed that card and said he was the best teacher we ever had. Well, we only had four before that, you know, but he's still the best. And I looked at that card. I got it yesterday. I looked at it. There's all of us kids. There's one girl that's still alive and she lives in, in, in uh, Camille, Georgia. And I'm going to call her on the phone. She signed that card four times. <laughs> that wasn't right. We, I didn't know she did that, but I can see it now I got the proof. I guess she wanted that teacher to think she loved him the best. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. She signed it four times. Folks, you need to sign your card four or five times. You want to make sure they know you love them. You know what I'm talking about? Stand up. God bless you. Hallelujah. That's all I can say when I, when I read these wonderful words in the book of Romans, Father. Thank you so much that you brought Saul of Tarsus into the kingdom of God. And he was used by the Holy Spirit to write these New Testament letters. Scripture given by inspiration from your very heart to our hearts. I pray that this would be a changing experience going on with these words for all of us. And that when we meet in just a few moments, we would be more inclined to loving and caring and reaching out to the long lost, to the recently lost, to, to the ones who seem to have been found but just couldn't find the way, no matter what the condition of someone, maybe reach out to them, Lord, and redeem them for the sake of your kingdom. Give us the strength that we need. We have no power no knowledge, no wisdom on our own, no, no ability, but you can give it to us. And I ask that you would give every person in this convocation right now, Lord. Hallelujah. Let's just sing a little chorus that, that says right to Jesus, you're all I need. You're all I need. That's, that's all you got to have right now. That's all that Paul needed on the road to Damascus. So let him change your life and give you the strength you need to reach out to people this week. You're going to pass them by stop somewhere along the way. It's been some time. 
and maybe change somebody's life for eternity. You're all I need. That's all you gotta have. You're all I need. Jesus, you're all kingdom of God and for the sake of your Savior Jesus. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. God bless you. Have a great day. Be with us Wednesday night, 7.30, live. Hey, God bless you too. Wednesday night, 7.30, Bible study. We're still on Jeremiah, so you're going to enjoy it. God bless y'all.